Well, my name is Nathan Schenk. It's my privilege to be with you today. My wife, Carrie, and I have been living and serving here in South Asia since graduating from university. Over the last two decades, in fact, arriving here in the year 2000, we've been privileged to see many expressions of the kingdom of God, the multiplication of churches among so many what we've known as hidden or unreached people groups. Do you realize the FTT effort, the finish the task effort, brings us together to celebrate 20 years since Amsterdam 2000. You might be aware of that history. In the year 2000, the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association played an instrumental role in calling together so many, in fact, hundreds of leaders from missions organizations, various church and denominational backgrounds to gather in Amsterdam to celebrate the fruit of Luzon Congress and for that matter, the AD 2000 movement, but ultimately also to measure, to and seek to discern how far we, the, we've been able to come in the Great Commission pursuit over 2,000 years of Great Commission history. You know that out of that same meeting, those hidden, those un, unreached peoples, among them, in the, in the midst of so much work going on around the world, it was recognized that many hundreds, even thousands of the world's people groups remained unengaged with the gospel. Well, of course, that's unacceptable. Gives birth to the, the vision that we might finish the task of starting with every people group, every nation, tribe, people, and language that will ultimately be represented before the throne of God, that within our generation, we might see them engaged with the gospel. As I mentioned, these two decades since 2000, where my wife and I have been privileged to see church, churches multiply around South Asia, we also have become aware of those, not just unreached peoples, but the unengaged, even here, in some cases, hidden in our very neighborhoods. What you might not know, in fact, over the two decades of time since Amsterdam 2000, the FTT effort, the finish the task, and other efforts just like FTT have been primary catalysts in the engagement of more than 2,500 people groups for the first time in Great Commission history. I want you to think about that with me. Two, two decades of time. In the context of 2,000 years of Great Commission history, if my math serves me correctly, that's 1% of Great Commission history. These last two decades, the decades of the FTT movement from the year 2000 till today, represent 1%, 20 of 2,000 years of Great Commission history. What I just said to you, what we would celebrate today as the fruit of efforts like FTT, over those 20 years, almost 100 people groups on average engaged for the first time since the Tower of Babel, having opportunity to know about the Messiah who has given a sacrifice for their sins. That's right, brothers and sisters. We have much to celebrate. We, in fact, are living in a Kairos generation when one out of five, 2,500 people groups, approximately 20% of the world's people groups engage for the first time in 1% of Great Commission history. I've heard it said, in fact, we've often taught that the matter of engagement is in, in some ways like the starting pistol at the beginning of the race. I love this about the finish the task movement, about the FTT effort. We would finish the task of starting among every people. Well, the implication there, if engagement is like the starting pistol of a race, we would assume we would be right to recognize we steward the laps of the race that must be run. That's what we're here 
to talk about today. The point of our session as we gather around the Word of God to ask of the Scripture, what are the critical components? What are, if you will, the laps of the race post-engagement? So that we might see not only churches established among peoples, indigenous expressions of the kingdom of God in local contexts and local cultures all over the world, but also that those churches that are re, might be reproducing, that they, in the midst of owning the task, owning the Great Commission effort for in the midst of every people group and place, that that church, that churches might give birth to churches, that generations of churches might actually constitute multiplication even as we anticipate a vast multitude from every nation, tribe, people, and language gathered around the throne. In the midst of such a, an, an enormous task, in the midst of such a, a scope of all the peoples of the planet, even in the midst of a Kairos generation where so many have been engaged for the first time, we would be deceiving ourselves if we thought our plans, our strategies, our abilities were sufficient. Isn't that what you love about the FTT effort and vision? The scope even of the task before us? No, not one of us could assume to be the answer. Not one of us would assume that we have in our minds, our thoughts, even our plans, strategy sufficient to finish the task. Ultimately, then we have no choice. Praise God, we still have no choice but to run to his word and ask of the word of God, how do we run the race that has begun? Would you join me for some Bible study? When we consider fidelity to the doctrine of the New Testament, we often use the term orthodoxy. Again, what we mean is that we draw our doctrine directly from the Word of God, from the first things of New Testament teaching. The same way, when we consider mission, it's important that we pursue orthopraxy, especially in the pioneer context where we're crossing cultures or barriers for the sake of engaging new peoples and places for the first time, we have no better place to go for orthopraxy than to run back to the pages of the New Testament. For that reason, as we sit down together, I want to ask you to open your Bible to the book actually titled Praxius. You might know it by its English name, the Book of Acts. You, as you turn, open your Bibles to Acts chapter 13, where we'll read together. We remember that across the book of Acts, Luke continues, continues to follow those concentric circles of expansion and kingdom impact outlined in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, where our Savior, on the day he ascended again to heaven, instructed his followers to remain in Jerusalem to await the promised Holy Spirit. For when he comes, Jesus said, you will receive power and you will be my witnesses, first of all in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and even to the ends of the earth. As we read across the first half of the book of Acts then, we begin to see this Jerusalem phase of ministry, the Judea and Samaria fields engaged through evangelists like Philip, Peter, Ultimately, we come to Acts chapter 13 and find in the intention sending of the church of Antioch, and from that church, the missionary sent ones, Barnabas and Saul, establishing, even solidifying the ends of the earth phase of mission among the ethne. Would you read with me in Acts chapter 13? I'll begin in verse number one. Now in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. We have five names listed here for us. Verse number two, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I've called them. 
So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. And what we have here is what's often termed the beginning of the first missionary journey of Paul. Of course, we see that it wasn't only Paul, but rather Barnabas and Saul, his name bef before the first journey here, identified based on the calling, the setting apart of the Holy Spirit of God. It's, there's several reasons we would turn to this passage and consider it a, a matter of orthopraxy in, in, the, in the sending of missionaries. For one, Luke gives to us in this passage the first time we see intention sending, and that also originating from this Antioch church. The church then gathered, its leaders in the midst of prayer and fasting, a posture of abiding, are able to hear the Spirit's voice and respond by releasing those sent ones into the work of mission. Perhaps more than any other reason that we would acknowledge this passage is the simple fact that one of the few places in all of the Bible where we might quote the third person of the Trinity is here in our text. You realize that spirit that was there hovering over the waters in Genesis chapter 1, even as an agent of creation, as God said, let there be light. The same one who literally picked up and carried, according to 1 Peter, Old Testament prophets who would give to us by inspiration the very words of God. This same Holy Spirit is often silent. It's rare that we can quote the Holy Spirit. What we have in this passage, unique in, a, in the sense that for the first time in all of the canon of Scripture, including post-Pentecost, we have the Holy Spirit of God speaking, being quoted, an instruction to the church. What is that instruction? Set apart for me these two, Barnabas and Saul, for the work to which I've called them. Now, Luke is introducing a section of Scripture here. The very quote offered by the Holy Spirit of God, realize the Holy Spirit initiated this Holy Spirit-empowered mission. He will be seen directing the steps of these missionaries at every turn throughout the missionary journey. But ultimately, we see the same section of Scripture come to its conclusion in Acts chapter 14. Would you turn one page with me in your Bible? Acts chapter 14, verse 26, the work initiated by the Holy Spirit is here again mentioned by Luke. Acts 14, 26 says this, from Atalia, they, Barnabas and Saul, Barnabas now called Paul, sailed back to Antioch, where they had been committed to the grace of God for the work they had now fulfilled, completed, accomplished. What Luke is doing here is utilizing a literary device. It's called an inclusio. It, it amounts to a set of brackets around a passage of scripture. In this case, the, the brackets are the work. Acts 13, 2, the Holy Spirit quoted, set apart Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I've called them. Acts 14, 23, Luke concludes the section with the second bracket, they returned where they'd been committed to the grace of God for the work they had now fulfilled, completed, accomplished. What Luke is doing in some sense, by putting brackets around this first missionary journey, he's telling us to read these two chapters as a textual unit, to read them together. Now, if we were a missionary sent out to engage the ethne, the peoples, even at the ends of the earth in our generation, and we wanted to pursue orthopraxy, to have fidelity to the first practices of mission, most especially in the pioneer context, that is the ends of the earth where we might be sent, it would be natural. In fact, it might be necessary 
that we revisit the book called Praxius and in fact find ourselves here in the center of the book of Acts looking at a textual unit designed around the work of mission. It seems appropriate then, if our desire is to finish the task, the work the Lord has assigned, that we would come to such a passage and simply ask the question, what was the work that Paul and Barnabas put their hand to? Secondly, how is it that the work they put their hand to could be described as fulfilled, completed, accomplished? Evidently, the work they had done had been done with integrity. Now, this passage is not new to any of us. Some of us have read this same first missionary journey hundreds of times. What's interesting as we consider the work that Barnabas and Saul, soon to be called Paul, were commissioned and sent to do is once again initiated, empowered, directed by the Holy Spirit we see these two sent ones, these two apostles, Acts chapter 14, 4, 14, 14, these sent ones pioneering in otherwise unreached and unengaged provinces and cities. You realize that pioneering the itinerant ministry of Barnabas and Paul across these two chapters leads them to encounter not only language barriers like that in Lystra, the Lyconian language, but also all sorts of pagan idolatry. For that matter, in several cases, in the transition from the Jewish synagogue, as we'll see in Pisidian Antioch, we see a turning consistent with Paul's statements of calling to the ethnic. We see them pioneering in and across the whole of the island of Cyprus, coming to Paphos, Sergius Apollos, the proconsul, hearing the word of the Lord and coming to faith later in Pisidian Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, Derby, as they pioneer in these among these peoples and places, over and over again, we hear on their lips the word of the Lord, the word of the Lord, the word of the Lord. It's actually nine times in two chapters that the word of the Lord is preached by these sent one missionaries. They cared as they pioneered for sowing the seed of the gospel witness. You realize that in Acts chapter 13, no less than 25 verses committed to a single sermon in Pisidian Antioch. Realize that as Paul and Barnabas went about preaching, not everywhere was that gospel received. In fact, as we look at the end of chapter 13, verse number 46, the Jewish audience there in the synagogue of Pisidian Antioch actually find themselves jealous of the response to the gospel. Verse number 46 says, Then Paul and Barnabas answered those who opposed them boldly. We had to speak the word of God to you first. Since you reject it and do not consider yourselves worthy of eternal life, we now turn to the ethne. For this is what the Lord has commanded us. Quoting the prophet Isaiah, Paul says, I have made you a light to the ethne that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. Verse 48, when the ethne heard this, they were glad and honored the word of the Lord. And all who were appointed to eternal life believed. Verse 49, this same word of the Lord spread through the whole region. 
so that not only do we see the pioneering missionaries engaging the field, in this case, Pisidian Antioch, preaching the word of the Lord among the ethne, but evidently we see those same ethne, those who had been appointed to eternal life, immediately turning and across the whole of the region, carrying on and joining the same work of seed sowing. Now, this is an important transition in the first missionary journey for before the end of chapter 13, in the last verse, verse number 52, we see the word disciples. There in Pisidian Antioch, the disciples were filled with joy and with this same Holy Spirit. So that where the gospel was preached, where the seed had been sown, we see new life emerging in the field in the form of disciples. At the end of chapter 13, realize that before the end of the journey in chapter 14, three additional times the word disciple will come up. In the Galatian cities of Iconium, Lystra, and Derby, even in Lystra, where Paul had been stoned presumably to death, his body drug outside the city. It was the new believers who gathered around him. The disciples gathered, and when they had prayed, Paul got up and went back into the city. It's disciples in Derby who are instructed, Lystra and Iconium as well, instructed by Barnabas and Paul that through many hardships, we must enter the kingdom of God. Paul and Barnabas not only pioneered, not only preached the gospel message, they nurtured the new growth in the form of disciples in each of those cities, even returning to cities where they had been persecuted. In Paul's case, even stoned presumably to death for the sake of encouraging this new growth. If you have your Bibles open, look at Acts chapter 14, verse number 23. On the return trip, revisiting all those same cities where they had sown the word of the Lord, where disciples had been made, we see that Paul and Barnabas go about appointing elders in all the churches. Evidently, they cared enough about church formation that they were willing to revisit and anticipated, even recognized, local shepherds, local elder overseers emerging from the harvest who could be appointed there to shepherd and steward the new flock. This missionary task, this first journey, described by Luke as the work, has these and carries these various components. The task of mission, for us to finish the task, requires that we pioneer. It is a task that begins with engagement. But realize as sure as engagement is the starting pistol, to switch metaphors, we also need to run the laps of the race. If you will, where we engage empty fields, we do so for the sake of gospel seed sowing. Where the gospel is sown, it is normal, natural, even partnership with the Holy Spirit of God to follow up, to nurture the new growth in the form of disciple making. Also, that where the harvest might be gathered, churches could be formed. Leaders might emerge, not only to shepherd the flock locally, but even in Acts chapter 16, verse 1, where we see Timothy emerging from this same church in Lystra, that they might join us in pioneering and gospel seed sowing in, in the next empty field. Do you recognize this pattern, the work of mission in the book of Acts? It's not just tied to the first journey, but what is introduced here, the bookends of the work in the first journey, we see them repeated in the second and in the third. 
we see them also taken up as stewardship among the churches that are left behind as Paul and Barnabas, later Paul and Silas, including Timothy, continued toward a Macedonian call, toward the Corinthian founding in the Achaean province, toward the founding of Ephesus in the province called Asia. In each case, through the ringing of the gospel, through disciple making and churches that plant churches, we see these evidence of multiplication, evidence of resources coming from the harvest that lead to the harvest. I believe this pattern, this work, each component of this work is essential. Where we are finishing the task of starting, the race is being run. Where we have engaged empty fields, gospel seed sowing, disciple making, church formation, and leadership reproduction that might carry on the process, this is the task we put our hands in. I imagine that you've been blessed by FTT as I have. As we go about seeking to steward our life, our days well, even according to Psalm 90, asking the Lord that he might teach us to number our days, that he might establish the work of our hands, the task, the task, the task, seeing it finished, seeing the Lord's return remains our highest priority. To be found doing his work when he comes is to hear, well done, good and faithful servant, according to Matthew 25. As we think about the work then, as we think about the task that must be finished, mobilizing disciples, mobilizing believers in our churches, our denomination, our sending organization, in each case, whoever that audience may be, simply a matter of asking the questions, answering the questions, who do I share with? If you will, who do I engage the gospel? FTT stands ready to help you answer that question. As you discern a target, as you find your calling to the ethne, even perhaps to the ends of the earth, a second question, what do I say? The matter of gospel seed sowing. How do we go about carrying the integrity of the word of the Lord among those who haven't heard? A third question, what do I do if they say yes? How do we go about making disciples? If you can answer that question in the hearts and minds of your disciples, they might be mobilized to go and make disciples also. Fourth question, how do we form the church? Beyond our preference, beyond our cultural expectations or even tra denominational traditions, what does the word of God have to say about the bride of Christ? How do we form them? If we might answer that question from the word of God, we might see our disciples even as church planters in the midst of pioneer fields. Finally, how might we reproduce leaders who could go and do all of these same things? Engage empty fields, sow the seed of the gospel with integrity, follow up in order to make disciples among those who say yes, form churches out of that harvest, and from the harvest, everything needed for the harvest, even raise up leaders who might go out again and multiply. This is the critical path to the multitude from every nation, tribe, people, and language. As I've studied English over my life, a vast multitude in Revelation chapter 7 does require that we multiply at some point. Are you willing to give these same tasks to your disciples? Are you willing to see them released and sent out even among the ethne, the peoples of the world? Maybe the prerequisite question, are you hearing the voice of the Spirit of God who continues to call out and to send laborers. To finish the task is to be found on mission. To finish the task is to send missionaries. How shall they call 
on the one of whom they have not heard. Romans 10 continues, how shall they hear unless someone preach to them? How shall they preach unless they be sent? To the local churches, to the denomination structures that might be listening in, the economy of the kingdom of God begins with sending. And we are, make no mistake, we are in the midst of a Kairos generation. A hundred years ago, a missionary hero of mine named J.O. Frazier worked among the Li Su people in southwest China. He had this to say about missionary work. On the human side, evangelistic work on the mission field is like a man going about in a dark, damp valley with a lighted match in his hand, seeking to ignite anything ignitable. But things are damp through and through and will not burn however much he tries. In other cases, God's wind and sunshine have prepared beforehand. The valley is dry in places, and when the lighted match is applied, here a shrub, there a tree, here a few sticks, there a heap of leaves, they take fire and they give light and warmth long after the kindled match and its bearer have passed on. This is what God wants to see, little patches of fire burning all over the world. With thanks to the finish the task effort and two decades of this generation, the millennial missions movement, if you will, there literally have been a thousand fires started all over the world. 20% of the world's people groups engaged in the last 1% of Great Commission history. If engagement is like a starting pistol, if engagement is like the entering of an empty field, the lapse of the race, the gospel seed sowing, the disciple making, the church formation, these laps of the race must be run. To use Frazier's metaphor, like wood being put onto a small fire. But be sure of this, brothers and sisters, as we move forward, as we continue to engage the unengaged and run the race of church planting among them, be sure of this fact. Those thousand fires that have been lit by organizations, efforts like FTT, all those fires are burning toward each other. And if you will, in this moment, recognize with me that the inferno is upon us. The work of the kingdom of God in our generation. Why couldn't we be the generation that finishes the task? FTT stands ready not only to cast vision, not only to, hand, to help you identify a people, but to equip and to train, to see you mobilized, your church, your denomination, even your missions organization, that gospel seed sowing might lead to discipleship, church formation, that from the fruit of those churches, we might see an ever increasing, even multiplied labor force joining us in the task of mission. Let me pray. Lord God, by the Spirit, by your initiation, by your power, by your direction, Lord God, as you led in the first century, we know, we trust you're at work in this generation. Do the work of calling. Do the work of sending among so many brothers and sisters who would respond to your call, Lord God. Show yourself powerful. Show yourself mighty. Show your wisdom among us. Lord God, where your word is dwelling in our heart, may we never, Lord God, run beyond, outpace your spirit, but in step with what you're doing, Lord God, may we be found about your business until the task is finished. We love you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.